Solving a quadratic equation is easy. And that's because we have a formula. We can obtain the roots from the coefficients of the equation by simply using addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and taking a root. If roots of a polynomial equation can be obtained in this way, they say that an equation is solvable by radicals, and it basically means that there exists a simple way of finding its roots, which is by some combination of the operations we just mentioned. But are all polynomial equations solvable by radicals? Does a similar formula exist for equations of higher degree? Today we'll answer this question using one of the most amazing and quite sophisticated methods in mathematics known as Galois theory. But first, let's talk about numbers. If we only consider equations with rational numbers as coefficients, the roots will quickly get us outside of this basic set. So, the roots of a simple equation, x squared minus 2 equals 0, are irrational numbers, square root of 2 and minus square root of 2. Let's append these two roots to the set of all rational numbers. But before we move on, let's get back to rational numbers just one more time. Rational numbers have one amazing property. When we add, subtract, multiply or divide two rational numbers, with the only exception of division by zero, we still get a rational number. In algebraic terminology, this means that rational numbers form a field. But after appending the two roots of our equation, we no longer have a field. For instance, adding 1 and square root of 2 already gets us outside of our set. So, instead of just appending the two roots, let's also append everything we can get as a result of any legitimate algebraic operations performed any finite number of times. And now we got ourselves a field. We extended the field of rational numbers with the help of square root of 2 and minus square root of 2. But it's easy to see that it was enough to only use square root of 2, because minus square root of 2 can be obtained by multiplying square root of 2 by minus 1. This new field, by the way, consists of all numbers of the following form, where x and y can be any rational numbers. Similarly, for any polynomial equation, we can create an extension field of rational numbers with the help of all of its roots. But let's get back to our previous example and see what happens if in this extended field we switch the roots around. So let's pick some element from our field and in it we will replace square root of 2 with minus square root of 2. Similarly, instead of this number we would have this one. This mapping certainly shuffles numbers around within our field, but something important remains unchanged. First of all, Notice that all rational numbers are not affected by this transformation. But there is more. Let's give this mapping a name. Let's use some fancy Greek letter for that. Phi. So, we can rewrite our expressions as follows. It's very easy to check by simply performing the required arithmetic operations that for any two numbers A and B from our field, Phi of A plus B equals Phi of A plus Phi of B. In other words, phi preserves addition, but it also preserves subtraction, multiplication and division. If we now take an arbitrary number x plus square root of 2y from our field and look at x and y as coordinates on the plane, then applying phi acts as a mirror reflection over the x-axis, a kind of a symmetry. But what if we applied symmetry phi twice to our field. A number would reflect off of the x-axis once and then one more time basically bringing it back to where it was. So applying phi twice in a row acts as a trivial transformation, which is also a symmetry. It only doesn't rearrange anything in our field. It just keeps everything in its place. Technically, any two symmetries phi and lambda of a given equation can be applied sequentially and the result will be another symmetry that we denote as follows. Applying the symmetry and then the other looks like an operation over symmetries. We use the little circle there and it looks a lot like some sort of multiplication. As a matter of fact, the symmetry that does not change anything in the field, 
acts as an identity element among symmetries and is often denoted as epsilon and acts precisely like one when multiplying numbers. Also, no matter what a symmetry is, by performing it backwards, we get an inverse symmetry. In our prior example of equation x square minus 2 equals 0, element phi that was switching the two roots is actually inverse to itself, because phi multiplied by phi gives us a trivial symmetry, epsilon. All symmetries of a given equation are called the Galois group of that equation. And solvability of an equation by radicals is tightly connected to properties of the equation's Galois group. And that's what we are about to uncover further. Our simple example of equation x square minus 2 equals 0 gave us a two-element group that consists of epsilon, the trivial symmetry, and phi, the symmetry that switches the two roots and can be thought of as a mirror reflection or just turning the set by 180 degrees. Using this analogy, we can say that an equation x to the 7th minus 2 equals 0 will have 7 roots and will have Galois group of 7 elements that can be thought of as the rotations of a heptagon. And rotating the heptagon by one notch will be an element phi of the group and every other element can be obtained by applying phi multiple times, which is the same as powers of phi. This equation, by the way, solved by radicals because all we need is to take 7th root of 2. And just like in the previous equation, we got square root of 2 and minus square root of 2 as the solutions. Here we have 7, generally speaking, complex numbers of a slightly more complicated form, but we don't really care. All we care about is that solving the equation requires obtaining a 7th root of 2 of a number, and that is something we know how to do. So, this is a good Galois group. Good in a sense that the corresponding equation is solvable by radicals. Groups like this one are called cyclic, as you can cycle uh, through all the symmetries in the entire group by applying just one symmetry over and over again. But to be good, Galois group doesn't necessarily have to be cyclic. It can be composed of multiple different cyclic groups, just like a combination lock is composed of multiple dials with digits. So, the following equation can be rewritten as follows, and we again know how to solve it. We just need to solve each of the component equations, x to the 7th minus 1 equals 0 and x to the 5th minus 1 equals 0, and we know how to do that by calculating 7th and 5th roots respectively. The Galois group for this 12th degree equation will look like a combination lock with two dials with 7 and 5 digits. This is no longer a cyclic group, but it still has one important property that cyclic groups have. For any two symmetries, phi and lambda, of such a group, applying phi and then lambda is the same as applying lambda and then phi. Wait, what? Now, this might sound weird, but this is where our so-called multiplication of symmetries differs from multiplication of numbers. When multiplying numbers, order doesn't matter. But with symmetries, or more generically with transformations, it may. Here's a little analogy that will help you understand this concept better. Imagine that we are transforming the look of a person. Let's say we have two transformations. Phi putting on a watch, and lambda, putting on shoes. If we apply phi and then lambda, this is what we get. Now, let's apply these two transformations in the opposite order. We apply lambda and then we apply phi, and this is what we get, which is exact same result. So, in this case, we say that phi multiplied by lambda is the same as lambda multiplied by phi. But let's now consider a slightly different pair of transformations. Xi putting on underwear and eta putting on trousers. Applying Xi and then eta gives us, roughly speaking, a very conventional outcome. But applying transformation eta and then Xi produces a noticeably different result. FYI, when multiplication order doesn't matter, a group is called Abelian, named after prominent Norwegian mathematician Niels Abel. 
And guess what? When the order does matter, we call the group non abelian So then cyclic groups are not the only good ones. Abelian groups are also good because an equation with an abelian Galois group is solvable by radicals. Now, our abelian groups have an interesting property. Let's pick one such group from the previous example. We can say that this group can be achieved by extending one cyclic group, say this one, with another cyclic group. And even if our abelian group was bigger and the corresponding combination log had more dials, the group can be achieved as a sequence of similar extensions. We start with a cyclic group and extend it with another cyclic one. Then the result of it is again extended with a cyclic group. The result of that extension, in turn, is again extended with a cyclic group, and so on. Every time we extend with a cyclic group, basically attaching a dial at a time to our combination lock. But the combination lock approach is not the only way to extend one group with another. Let's take one dial with six digits on it, but this time allow to not only rotate it as before, but also flip it, like so. This group is also an example of extending one cyclic group with another cyclic group, more specifically a group with six elements with a group of two elements. But the result will be a non-abelian group, because performing a simple rotation and then flipping gives us a different result than flipping first and then rotating. And by the way, this particular group is a Galois group for the following equation. Every time we can obtain our Galois group as a sequence of extensions by cyclic groups, the equation will be solvable by radicals. And it doesn't matter how we extend it, whether using a combination lock approach or by flipping a polygon or even in some completely different way. This type of groups was subsequently named solvable to reflect the fact that the corresponding equation is solvable by radicals. But are all Galois groups solvable? In other words, can any Galois group be obtained as a series of cyclic extensions? The answer is no. If you consider this equation, its Galois group is the group of all possible permutations of the equation's five roots and is usually denoted as S5. And it turns out that you cannot build this group as a series of cyclic extensions. Permutations of 2, 3 and 4 roots, sure. 5 and above, no. And this is the beauty of Galois theory. It first establishes that an equation is solvable by radicals if and only if its group of symmetries, which we call the Galois group, is solvable. This is a military maneuver of taking the battle to the turf where you have a greater chance to win. And once you did, you deal with groups and not with polynomials anymore. And here we can prove, for instance, that the group of all permutations of 5, 6 or more roots is non-solvable. And the immediate implication of that is that the corresponding equations are not solvable by radicals either. So the general answer is... Only equations of degree lower than 5 are all solvable by radicals. But starting with 5 and above, there are equations that do not have a formula in radicals. Galois theory that rests on the great work of Ruffini, Lagrange, Abel and then ultimately Evariste Galois is one of the roots of the broad and powerful branch of mathematics known today as group theory with applications in chemistry, material science, physics, cryptography, and other domains. The idea that instead of studying some objects directly, we may study their symmetries, and then from there much easier obtain some properties of the objects themselves, is a very powerful idea. And it's amazing that Galois Group was one of the earliest examples of that greatness of human thought. Thank you for watching. If you find this video helpful, please hit the like button, share it with friends and subscribe to my channel.